In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Consoler, Spirit of Truth, present in all places and filling all things, the treasury of blessings and the giver of life, come and dwell within us. Cleanse us of all sin and save our souls, O good one. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our speaker this evening is the Director of Academic Research and President of Pontifical Studies Foundation, which supports the work of the Eucharistic Project. Dr. Kenneth J. Howell taught in higher education for almost 13 years. He was a Presbyterian, I'm sorry, 30 years. <laughs> he almost got me on that, for almost 30 years. He was a Presbyterian minister for 18 years. During his ministry and teaching, Dr. Howell's own reading on the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist started him on a six-year journey that eventually led him to Catholicism. On June 1, 1996, Dr. Howell was confirmed and received into the Catholic Church at St. Charles Borromeo Parish in Bloomington, Indiana. And in 2000, he received the Pro Ecclesia et Pontifice Award from St. John Paul II in recognition of his service to the church. Please join me in welcoming back Dr. Howe. Welcome, Dr. Howe. Welcome. Thank you so much. It's wonderful to be with you this evening. I, um, tonight, what I'd, I'd like to do is to, as of course the announced theme is the Desert Fathers, um, what I'd like to do tonight is to take some time to introduce you, and Father said it so beautifully, to contextualize a little bit some of the things that we learn from the fathers and uh, see how they apply to our lives uh, today. You have then the outline, I presume, that Andy has put together for you. It's called the Desert Fathers of Alexandria. It's the one that he was referring to in the chat, I believe. Um, if you have that, either um, in paper form or whatever, and if you want to go, as Father said, if you want to get up and print it, uh, that it would certainly, you can still hear what we're talking about. But there is one thing I'd like to begin with tonight that is not on that sheet. And I thought about this later because I was trying to ask the question, as actually the Desert Fathers themselves asked. Uh, they asked, who was the first individual? Who was the first man who went out into the desert? And there was debate about whether it was Anthony or Paul of Thebes and so forth. And I think the answer is pretty clear. It wasn't Anthony. Now, Anthony is one of the most famous, but there was somebody before him. But actually, whoever the first desert father was, there was somebody centuries before him. And that's what I'd like you to turn with me in your Bible to Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11. And let's look at the original desert father who is our Lord Jesus Christ himself. In the Latin Rite Church in Niway, yesterday, uh, on, I mean on Sunday, we had the gospel reading was from the Gospel of Mark, and it was the story about Jesus going into the desert to be tempted. However, in Mark's gospel, that's the shortest version of the story. The story occurs in all three synoptic Gospels. And in Matthew's and Luke's account, there's a longer version, but they're slightly different from one another. Now, that shouldn't bother us at all, because the beauty of Scripture is that it's like different angles looking at the same reality. And, it, and the different angles reveal something rich and wonderful about the event. Tonight, I've chosen Matthew chapter 4, because I want us to understand uh, something about the temptation as Matthew relates it. So I'm going to begin reading now in Matthew chapter 4, verses one, verse 1. Then Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. And after he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he then became hungry. And the tempter came to him and said, If you are the Son of God, Command that these stones become bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. He's quoting from Deuteronomy chapter 8 there. 
Then the devil took him to the holy city and had him stand on the pinnacle of the temple. And he said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will give his angels charge concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. But Jesus said to him, On the other hand, it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to, he said to him, All these things I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God and serve him alone. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and began to minister to him. Well, the reason that I wanted to read this text tonight is this. I want us to note several things about Matthew's telling of the story of Jesus in the desert. Because these themes that I'm going to mention reverberate throughout the Desert Fathers later on. Perhaps the most significant is the way that Matthew says that Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert. In other words, Jesus did not, wasn't just forced to go into the desert by some force external to himself. He was, as, as it were, in a divine conspiracy with the Spirit and with God the Father because his task on earth was as the God-man was to come and to defeat the devil. So his entry into the desert to be tempted is in fact his attempt to do battle with the devil. That's a theme that we'll see over and over again in the Desert Fathers. You notice it also said that after 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. Now that seems on the surface perhaps like a uh, the obvious detail that would need to, need to be said. But what it means is that part of our experience, or part of Jesus' experience as God on earth, as the God-man, was that he experienced severe bodily deprivation. This church, the, the Desert Fathers talk about this in various ways, about the fasting, and the some of them just ate very minimal food for years upon years on end but here what we find in is that the lord jesus is giving us a model that to do battle with the devil it requires sacrifice we'll come back to that theme later on the third and perhaps the most important feature of this text is the way that the devil tempts him he says to him twice the first two temptations if you are the son of god if you are the Son of God, Jesus' trial in the desert was, the devil was trying to get him to abandon his vocation as the Son of God. And when you think about it, that's the way the devil attacks each one of us. Each one of us has a unique place within the world. I imagine that the majority of people that I see on the screen tonight are married people. I can see one couple for sure that's married. Okay. But whether in your your whether it's marriage or consecrated religious life, God has a has a, a mission for each and every one of us. The devil's task is to take you out of the Lord's army, to to nullify you, to to make you powerless. And so Jesus goes out into the desert and the devil attacks him at precisely the point that might be his greatest vulnerability. If you are the Son of God, and I can imagine the Lord as a man saying, yes, I am the Son of God, and he knows he's the Son of God, and he had the power to change the stones into bread, but he didn't use it. And that leads to the fourth point. That first temptation, if you are the Son of God, command that these stones would become bread. Why did Jesus not do that? Well, because what Jesus was, what was being tempted to do 
was to use his power for his own personal comfort and to try to obviate, to try to go around the spiritual struggle that was in front of him. If we are to be disciples of the Lord Jesus, we have to be willing to face the devil down. We have to be willing to enter into that spiritual struggle. And even as I say that, I feel like St. Augustine said, you know, here I am preaching these words, but I myself am a failure in, in, in living them out. It's very difficult for any of us to make that commitment of spiritual, to, to enter into the spiritual battle, the spiritual struggle. But that's what the church, that's what these desert fathers want to teach us. But then there's also the last temptation, where he takes Jesus and he puts him on a very high mountain and he says, see all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. I will give you all of these if you fall down and worship me. There's something very profound in that temptation. And it is this, that in the end, every temptation of life raises the question, whom will you worship? Who is going to be your Lord and your master? And sometimes following God in the vicissitudes, the, the flow of everyday life, means that we sometimes seem to be walking in the dark. We don't know where we're going. And things don't seem to be working out the way that we had hoped they would. But that's not really the question. Because as Mother Teresa reminded us so many times, God doesn't call us to be successful. He calls us to be faithful. And so the question that, that the devil was posing to Jesus is the same question that we have to ask ourselves. Who am I going to worship? Whose loyalty demands first place in my life? That is what motivated the desert fathers. They had made a decision to go out into the desert and to do battle with the devil. So let's go to that first section. It's Roman numeral one, and it's what are the sources of our knowledge of the Desert Fathers? Now, I'm sure that some of you that are listening to me tonight are, have already read the Desert Fathers, or at least some of them. You know some of the stories, and I'm sure that you um, have benefited from them. But because I don't know the backgrounds of the people that I'm talking to tonight, I'm going to need to kind of start at the beginning. What I'd like first to do is to, re, is to show you some of these, um, the titles of these books or these pamphlets that have been written, uh, usually in about the fourth century, about the Desert Fathers. These stories were about the Desert Fathers, and they're almost all these short stories about one one monk going to another monk and talking about something or a problem or and the more older monk maybe encouraging the younger monk stay in your cell stay faithful to your vocation in all of these there are there are some common themes which we'll get to but the first and most famous of all the writings is undoubtedly that written by the great athanasius of alexandria saint athanasius wrote the life of anthony of egypt while Athanasius was the bishop in Alexandria, there in Egypt, we find that there is, uh, we find that uh, he befriended Anthony of Egypt. And Anthony had lived out in the desert for, I think it was something like 80 years, something that I can't. But in the story, what you find is that in the early sections of this document, Athanasius is describing the spiritual struggles that Anthony was going through. And as he goes through the struggles, finally he comes to a place of rest. And Anthony asked the Lord the question, Lord, where were you in my struggles? Here I was battling the devil on the right and on the left. Where were you? And the Lord answers him and says, I was here, but I waited to see, to see your struggle. And since you have endured and have overcome, I will be a great source of strength for you, and your name will be known to, all, to many people. So Anthony undergoes this struggle as an example to us for what God is asking us to do. But just as Anthony, in the midst of his struggle, 
probably felt abandoned by God, that temptation has come to the great saints of the past over and over and over again. That dark night of the soul, as it were. Um, I'm using that word rather loosely, not in the, in the limited technical sense that John of the Cross uses it. But let's think, for example, for a moment of, of that beautiful creature, beautiful woman, St. Therese of Lisieux. Here she was at 24 years old, dying of tuberculosis. And she was in absolute agony. And at times she tells us that she was tempted even to deny the existence of God. Because how could she reconcile God, God's tenderness and mercy and love with what she was experiencing in her daily life, in that pain? And yet God was there with her. He was purifying her soul through this suffering. And he was preparing her to be a great intercessor in heaven. As she later said, I will spend my eternity doing good on earth. Well, that spirit is, begins with the Desert Fathers that comes all the way through the history of the church. And so Anthony, after this struggle, is even more committed to doing battle with the devil. And he quotes from the psalmist that says, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. Now, I know that I'm speaking to faithful Christians tonight. And I know that in, in the light of that, that most of us probably in the world in which we're living feel some sense of uh, tension or disappointment or frustration about the world. We'd like to see the world be more attached to Christ, more involved in his church. We would like to see even our own family members more deeply in love with God. Well, then what we need to do is what Anthony did. We need to quote the psalmist, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. But who are our enemies? The greatest enemy of all is the one we must do battle with, the devil himself. In the second writing that's listed there, The Life of Paul of Thebes by St. Jerome, and by the way, I was a little precipitous, it isn't actually found in his writing, De Virius Illustribus. Uh, he wrote this thing about great, great, great people, and that's what, about illustrious men. Uh, but actually, I discovered later on that this writing about Paul of Thebes is not in that collection. But in any case, there is this book that, that Jerome wrote. And this is, part of this is an answer to the question, who was the first desert father? Now, Paul is reputed to have lived during the mid-2nd century. This is during the 250s. This is during the reigns of the Emperor Decius, who was the first emperor to uh, institute a, uh, uh, an empire-wide um, persecution of Christians. But then under Valerius, who was toward the late 250s, the great saints, Saints Cyprian of Carthage, and Cornelius, the Pope, the Bishop of Rome, they were martyred in the late, in about 258. It was during this time that Paul was out in the Egyptian desert. Paul was apparently a learned man. So uh, Jerome tells us he was fluent not only in Latin, but in Greek, and probably as well a, a native Egyptian language that he had. And he had inherited great wealth, by the way, Anthony was a wealthy man too, but he gave all of his wealth away to the poor, and then he went out into the desert. And Paul apparently did the same thing. As he went deep into the desert, Jerome tells us he lived the life of heaven on earth for 113 years. Without any of the comforts of the modern world, he lived this, life, this very austere life. This was at the same time that Anthony was in the desert. And in fact, part of the story is that Anthony goes in search of Paul because the monks had a tendency, when they've heard about a, a really holy monk, they would go to try to find that monk. They lived somewhere else in the, in the, in the Egyptian desert. Well, uh, Jerome calls Paul a soldier of Christ because he had a desire more than anything to die and to be with God. Now imagine that. 
let's say Paul at 70 years old had re realized that, you know, my greatest joy is going to be to die and to go to heaven, to be with God. And so for 30, uh, 43 years, he's begging God to end his life so that he could go to be with God. And God lets him live till he's 113. I remember a priest from Australia telling me one time that uh, that phrase, you know, only the good die young. I don't know how true that is, but what he, what he was trying to say was that, you know, when you're holy and you're ready to go like St. Therese, you might die early just because you're ready to go to heaven. Well, I guess Paul, it took him a long time to, to, uh, to get ready to go to heaven. But Anthony, Anthony thought Paul was a saint walking on earth. And so it's recorded that Anthony saw Christ in Paul. I'm quoting now. He saw Christ in Paul and worshipped God in Paul's heart. In the end of the story, Anthony is with Paul when Paul dies. And he prays. Anthony prays, Lord, let me die too and fall beside thy soldier, O Christ. Let me, be, let me draw my last breath. In other words, here he saw a man who at the end of his life exuded holiness, and Anthony wanted that. And Jerome tells the story in such a way, pulling on the story of Elijah and Elisha. Remember when Elisha uh, picked up the, 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 the tunic from Elijah, right, after he went up into heaven? Well, he says that Anthony picked up the tunic, and he wore it on Easter and on Pentecost when he went into town to church. So this is a wonderful story about, about Paul and about these two men that together were searching for holiness. The third text that's listed on your outline there is the history of the monks of Egypt. I've, re I've looked at the gr original Greek text online, but I have not been able to tell who actually wrote this. But, but we do know that we have a Latin translation from Rufinus of Aquileia, who was around the same time as, as Jerome. In fact, he was a, a friend of St. Jerome's in the fourth century. Now, this, this history of the monks of Egypt consists of a lot of short stories of various presbyters. And let me explain that term for just a moment. That's the common term that they use in Greek. The, the priests in the early centuries of the church were called presbyters. But the word was also used in a non-technical sense because presbyteros in Greek means an older man. Like, you know, you look at my, my face and say, oh, he's a presbyteros. You know, he's, he's definitely an old guy, right? Now, uh, the, the uh, men who went out into the desert, they too were called presbyters or simply elders. They lived in the deserts of Egypt and the stories that you read about them in the history of the monks of Egypt. Some of them are a little bit difficult to discern exactly why the author told us this story, because they seem to end and you don't quite get the point of it. And that, by the way, reminds me, I, I mean, I've been, reading, I've been reading ancient documents since I was probably 18 years old, it, certainly the New Testament and then other church fathers and so forth. And I don't want to make a sweeping generalization but I think that many modern people cannot read these documents and really understand them. They need this kind of verbal introduction to them to get a sense of what they're about so that when they do start reading them, they're able to, to glean something useful. But one of the longer stories in the history of the monks of Egypt is about a monk named Paphnutius. In the story, Paphnutius asks God, God, show me what saint I am most like. Right? And I think he was asking probably for a vision, you know, show me the saints in heaven. Show me what kind of saint I'm like. And then God says, okay, get up. I want you to go talk to this singer, this man in the town who's a singer. So he, even as strange as this is to Paphnutius, he figures, well, it's come from God. So God must do what he's doing. So he goes to search out this man who's a singer. Now you got to remember Singer in the ancient world is not just a man with a nice voice. He was a man, he was like what we might associate in our minds with the Hollywood crowd, right? I mean, these were people that were living very immoral lives.
So he's very struck by the fact that God is asking him to go talk to this man who's probably involved in some very immoral entertainment. In any case, he goes and talks to the man. And the man says to him, I'm a sinner. I'm not holy at all. In fact, I used to be a thief. And he's, and so, Ant, I mean, Epaphnutius kind of implies, well, you must have done something good. Tell me what you did that was good. And he said, well, when I was a thief, I was in this band of, of thieves, and we'd come across a consecrated virgin. And all of my fellow thieves were all in favor of, as it puts it very delicately, deflowering her. Right? And he says, I stepped in, and I took her away, and I took her back to her home so that she wouldn't be, uh, she wouldn't be defiled. And then Paphnutius thinks, ah, this man, he truly is. He's living in the city. I'm living in the desert. But this man is truly a good man. Well, then Paphnutius asks God again, God, show me what saint I'm most like. So he leaves, so he says, go in, back into the village and meet the, the chief sort of of the village, like the mayor, the man who was the head of the village. And so in obedience to God, he does. And he goes by and he asks the man, well, you know, what have you done? And he tells him this, he tells him that, various things. And then Paphnutius learns something very valuable that I'm going to come back to at the end of our time tonight. I'll read from the story, but I'll wait till the very end tonight. Here's what he learns. Is that in every state of life, there are those who please God. You don't have to go into the desert. The men who went into the desert, and by the way, it wasn't just men, the men and women who went into the desert were searching intensely for God. But whatever state of life we are in, we can and should seek holiness. As I say, we'll talk about more on that later. The next uh, document that's listed in your, uh, in your outline there is, I've already referred to St. Jerome. By the way, St. Jerome lived in the second half of the fourth century, so he lived maybe 75 or, yeah, about 75 years after Anthony was living. Uh, he was a a younger contemporary of St. Athanasius. Except Jerome, he was kind of unique because he didn't live just in the West. He didn't live just in the East. He traveled all around. Finally, he ended up where I'm sure you know, he lived where our Lord was born. He lived in Bethlehem. There he began to translate the scriptures from Hebrew and from Greek into Latin. That became the Vulgate translation. And he's left us some beautiful, uh, beautiful uh, writings. By the way, um, Jerome, not just he, apart from his Christian beliefs, apart from his holiness, he was a man like St. Augustine, who is a model for us in several respects. I think Jerome might have, might have uh, matched someone as great as the great Cicero or Seneca as Latin writers. When I read his Latin, I say, wow, this man was a tremendous writer, tremendous stylist. He was very educated. He was very intelligent. He taught himself Hebrew. And when, in a time when it was very difficult to do that, he learned to speak Greek fluently. And he, could, he had all of this learning. And, he, and yet, his greatest desire was for God. Jerome also is interesting, too, in two respects. One of the reasons he was so dedicated to learning Hebrew was because it helped him with his problem of lust, because he would have these sexual thoughts over and over and over again. And as long as he concentrated on his Hebrew vowels and his Hebrew consonants, you know, he would deflect all of those uh, sensuous thoughts that he had. But the other problem that, that Jerome had, which should give some of us, maybe us men especially, uh, some sense of comfort, is that he really struggled with the sin of anger. And you'll see that in the letter that I'm going to read now, parts from. He, he could get really angry really, really quick in a bad temper. Now, that makes me almost think that he must have been Irish. But because, uh, because I'm, I'm Irish, <laughs> right? And uh, when I was a little boy, boy, I had a bad temper, right? But God's grace can do miracles 
in a man's life. And they did miracles in Jerome's life as well. But why is Jerome a saint? Because with all of his problems, he was committed to holiness. No matter what we bring to the table, as if we are committed to the pursuit of holiness, God will hear us and God will begin to do that work that we need within our souls. Anyway, this letter, uh, letter 14, is definitely worth reading. But let me tell you about the letter. This is after, he, he had a very close friend, a fellow monk. His name was Heliodorus. And Heliodorus decided to go back home, to leave the desert, and to go back home Perhaps we're not quite sure why, but there's indications in the letter that it might have been because his family needed him. Now, that seems like a very noble thing, but you'll see from the letter as I read parts of it that Jerome is really upset with him because he had pleaded with Heliodorus, don't leave the desert. This is the calling that God has given us. And so I just want to read a little bit of it. Just a little bit way into the letter, he says, Why am I foolishly begging you again? Away with the entreaties, away with coaxing words. Offended love does well to be angry. And actually, the Latin actually just says, Love ought to be angry. In other words, why should he be angry with Heliodorus? Because Heliodorus had, had forsaken his vocation, at least as Jerome had understood it. He said, you have spurned my petition, so maybe you'll listen now to my rebuke. And so he goes on, what keeps you, effeminate soldier, in your father's house? Where are your ramparts? Where are your, your trenches? Have you spent a winter in the field? The, su the trumpet is sounding from heaven. The leader comes with the clouds. He's talking about the book of Revelation where Jesus comes in the clouds. He's armed to subdue the world and out of his mouth, precedes a two-edged sword to mow down all that it encounters. You can see how he's calling Heliodorus to enter into the spiritual battle. But as for you, Heliodorus, what will you do? Pass straight from your chamber and go into the battlefield, from the cool shade into the burning sun. A body that is used to a tunic cannot endure a buckler. A head that has worn a cap can't take on a soldier's helmet. A hand that is made tender by disuse is galled by a sword hilt. Hear the proclamation of your king. He who is not with me is against me. And he who does not gather with me scatters. He's really putting it boldly out there in Eliodorus. Eliodorus, take seriously what you have done. Now, I'm not sure that Jerome would have spoken this way to you and me because we've never vowed to be monks. But nevertheless, he's very upset with Heliodorus because as he sees it, now he says something that I think applies to all of us. Remember the day in which you enlisted in the army, when you were buried with Christ in baptism, when you swore fidelity to him, declaring that for his sake you would spare neither father nor mother. The enemy is striving to slay Christ in your breast. In other words, the enemy, you have Christ within you, but the enemy wants to destroy Christ within you because the devil is possessed by hate. Hate for God and hate for anybody that wants to be with God. And so he urges him with dry eyes, fly to the standard of the cross, the standard like, you know, the min military insignia that, 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 that uh, let's say, Constantine used uh, at the beginning of this century. He says, in such cases, cruelty, meaning, in other words, leaving your family, cruelty is the only true affection. Well, we can talk about this a little bit later, but I wanted to give you just a sense of this, um, of what he says about him. Now, if you look at the next section, this is section two on your outline. The section that is entitled, what are the main teachings of the Desert Fathers? I'm just going to let your eyes read down, them, but just in case you don't have them in front of you at the moment, let me just run through them quickly. We're going to come back to these next week because next week 
we're going to then probe more deeply into each one of these themes that the church, I mean, that the Desert Fathers talk about. The first one is anger. It's a common human problem. How do we deal with it? Right? And it's really interesting that you see, and I'm sure that you're all aware, as I'm aware, of the terrible tragedy that took place in Parkland, Florida this past, this past week. That came really home to me because I'm a native Floridian. And also because my brother-in-law, my wife's younger brother, was the chief sheriff in that town in Parkland, Florida. He lived five minutes from that school. And so it's come very home, close home to our family. But you, had, you talk, you have, you have these people, you know, protesting about gun control and so forth and so on. But nobody's talking about anger. <laughs> this, this young man was obviously harboring a tremendous amount of anger inside of him. Well, why did nobody help him with that? Why did nobody, as it were, be a, a spiritual guide to him? The second theme is asceticism. We've already talked about that. That is abundantly clear in the Desert Fathers. And remember that the word asceticism comes from the Greek word askeo. It's like A-S-K-E-O, askeo. The Greek verb askeo means to train in either a military or an athletic sense. But the, to, that's what asceticism is. It's a training of the body and of the mind in order to be purified of the impurities that are part of our life. And I put these in, uh, in alphabetical order. The next word is acedia or acadia, as they, trans, as, they, uh, as they pronounced it in Greek. This is one we'll spend some time on next week, but I'll just mention. Acadia is a kind of inertness, a listlessness. In the church fathers, especially John Cassian, who was a monk, who then ended up in Gaul or modern or France, he says it's an inertness, a listness, an aversion to one's place. You know how it is when people perhaps live in a certain place and they say, oh, I've got to get out of here. I don't, this is driving me crazy and so forth. That's Acadia. Or it's a boredom with one's own self. One of the great temptations of the desert monks is that they they get into this cell there they made this commitment to to be purified and to come closer to god and then they have this almost overwhelming urge to get out of their cell and this they call acadia or the noonday devil and one that really struck me is listed by saint john cassian he says that acadia is the scorn and contempt of one's brethren that's an interesting one. The scorn and contempt of one's brethren. Let me tell you a true story without revealing, like a confession. I'll tell you the story without revealing the names, okay? You don't know these people. But this story was just really struck me. Yesterday, I was online. I was in emailing with a friend of mine who lives um, in the East Coast. And he was telling me about a professor at his school who is a theologian. And this theologian grew up Catholic. Apparently, from what I can glean, it must have been a, a faithful Catholic family. Maybe there were some problems. I don't know exactly. But one thing I do know, this man, as my friend describes him, was incredibly uncharitable, not only toward people that he that he didn't know, but even toward his own students. He gives an example. He said that this professor, he was, he was raised Catholic, but now he's a Protestant theologian. And he used a very strong word. He said at every turn, he tries to uh, demean Catholics in everything that he says. Well, I used to be a Presbyterian. I no longer believe Presbyterian doctrine, but God forgive me if I've ever demeaned any of my Presbyterian brothers and sisters. Because I'm not saying I'm better than this man. I'm simply saying God doesn't want us to despise other people, to scorn other people. Something is wrong inside of a man when he does that kind of a thing. I suggested very simply, how can this man call himself a Christian? Am I too naive just to suggest that 1 John 4.20 says, how can a man say he loves God and hates his brother? 
He's a liar if he does that. Well, this kind of a problem comes up in the disease, I think is the right word, the disease of Acedia or Acadia. Next one. Some of the stories of the, of the Desert Fathers emphasize compassion over strictness. If you've never read the letter, if you've never read the story, it, by the way, is in, where's my book? Uh, here it is. This is, had this book by uh, Helen Waddell uh, has, it's called The Desert Fathers, translated and introduced by Helen Waddell. This book has most of the stories that, that I'm telling you tonight in there. Not all of them, but, but most of them. In this, there is the story of St. Mary the harlot. She's also called St. Mary of Egypt. Now, how could a harlot be a saint, right? Well, it's a beautiful story of this man, this monk named Abraham. His brother dies and leaves a seven-year-old daughter. And they bring him, they bring the daughter to her uncle, Abraham, who's out in the desert. And he makes a cell right next to his with a little bit of an opening where he can give her food every day. She grows into, you know, a young woman. And one day while Abraham is away, somebody comes and deflowers her. Somebody rapes her. Somebody, you know, abuses her. And she is, we don't, we're not really told what she was thinking, but she decides to leave. Maybe she's so ashamed of what happened that she just leaves and she goes off into the city and she becomes a prostitute. And so in the story, Abraham, her uncle, dresses up. And so he doesn't look like a monk. He looks like an ordinary man, but he kind of half covers his face and he goes into the brothel to get his, his niece. And he even does it so that she, he's going to become her customer. Right? And when they're alone, he says to her, my daughter, Mary, do not, or not recognize me. Do you not see who I am? And finally she realizes, this is my uncle Abraham. And he says, daughter, you don't, 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 uh, don't weep. Don't just come home. Leave this life that you're living. And in the story, it's so beautifully put. It says, "Falling, there is nothing strange about falling into the pit. But what is really bad is to stay in the pit. She then, after he leaves, decides, I am going to go back home to my uncle Abraham. And she leaves her life. That's why she's a saint. And because she left the life that she fell into. Well, what is all this to say? And I can see that my time is really going, so let me go very quickly. Let me go now to the section under A. It's, at least in my sheet, is at the bottom. How do we fight the devil? <clears throat> well, it's very simple, by becoming holy. We become holy, and that destroys the kingdom of darkness. Let me just mention this one point. I was talking about what happened in Florida, and I know that we've all probably been grieving over that. But you notice that the response of this in the media is what you hear over and over and over again in the media and in American society. There is this belief, this I would call it an illusion, that we can change people by changing the law. The Desert Fathers remind us that change does not come by legislation. Change comes by excavation. What do I mean by excavation? By digging deep into the human soul. By facing the demons that are inside of each of us. And in facing those demons, God in his grace and his mercy allows us to actually become holy. We cannot be holy ourselves. That was the danger. That was the heresy of Pelagianism, that we can save ourselves. We cannot. Only God's grace can save us. But we have to have open hearts to do that. So with regard to the society out there, remember, true change is not going to come in our society through legislation. The legislation might force us to do certain things, but it won't change American culture. Because American culture can only be changed from the inside 
out. Remember, change doesn't come by legislation, it comes by excavation, going into the interior life. But why does the world not do that? Because it's so much harder. It's so much more difficult to change people than it is to change laws, right? Now, why is this important? Or how does that play into this, uh, what we're considering tonight? On A, on your outline, I wanted just to mention some of the reasons, some of the things that are mentioned by the Desert Fathers over and over and over again. The first one is silence. We live, and I'm going to return to this in the third session on March the 6th, and we'll talk a lot about silence. But silence, we live in a world that is just filled with noise. Wherever you go, you go into a restaurant, you go into any estab public establishment, and there's just noise, noise, noise all around you, right? And even on a purely psychological level, that has got to be not healthy for the human person, right? People, young people are on social media all the time. And by the way, I don't have these on the tip of my tongue or my fingers, but there are many studies now that are showing the damaging effects of using social media for the young people of our society. And it's so easy. People use today, parents sometimes use social media the way that, that I used TV, and that is a babysitter, right? And, and yet you've got to ask yourself the question, do we love our young people enough to guide them in the proper use of social media? But in any case, what people need is, what we all need is silence. Silence is a prerequisite to finding peace with God because it means listening to and for God's voice. In the clamor and the din of the world's noise, it means a willingness to live a hidden life. And that, I think, is one of the greatest things of by way of example that these desert fathers show us. In other words, we should not be seeking a life with honors and recognition. We should be willing to live the hidden life, as our Lord Jesus did until he was more or less forced out into the public eye. But most of all, silence gets us ready to encounter God. And that's the scariest thing of all, is to encounter God. Because as human beings, we're going to be encountering somebody who's infinitely above us. And yet, it's necessary to go, to be like on the anvil and to let the divine charity let god's love uh, hammer us so that we become holy so that we become saints well the second thing that's there real quickly then you'll see on the outline is focusing our life on what's important and that's obviously related to the first thing we talked about silence i personally do not see how a human being can figure out what's most important in his or her life unless you take time, quiet time to pray, to meditate, to listen to the Holy Spirit speak through the pages of Scripture and the great writings of the church. We have to be people who in silence learn to focus on what's important. And what's important, the, the Desert Fathers remind us, is that in some way, we're going to have to fight the spiritual battle that's out there. But the spiritual battle that's out there is also in here. It's inside of us. And that's where we do it. In other words, you cannot become holy without asceticism, without self-mastery. That's what asceticism really is all about. Modern people are focused on conquering challenges outside of themselves. But holiness is on conquering the, the, the demons inside of ourselves. So that by becoming holy, being members of the mystical body of Christ, we share those graces with others. How much time do we have left now? Although it's not a hard break, I understand. Uh, 10 minutes. Okay, good. Thank you. All right. The third thing, 
on your thing, it's C, perseverance, endurance, and stability. A number of the stories that are in the Desert Fathers are very simply this. You have made a commitment. Stay true to that commitment. Do not give up. Be faithful to what God has called you. And the way they say it among the Desert Fathers is, the one, one of the monks will say to the other monk, go back to your cell and stay there and wait upon God to come meet you there. But this comes up in so many ways. For example, I just thought at the top of my head, James chapter 1 and verse 12, it says, Blessed is the man who endures under trial. When we have endured trials, we often come out better on the other side. Now, I just, can I see a show of hands? How many of you are married? So you've been, so you've had moments of difficulty in your marriage, no doubt, right? Now, some of you, are, maybe you're already saints. <laughs> I see that. Okay. <laughs> uh, all of us have moments where our communication is not right, where we misjudge our spouse and they misjudge us, so forth and so on. But have you also experienced that when you have those difficult times and you both make the commitment to work on it, to work together, to love one, one another no matter what, that the relationship gets better as you go through the trial together. Your relationship actually deepens as a result of your commitment, your stability to your marriage. It's the same way with vowed religious. I remember a, a beautiful religious sister that I know she went through a time of, of really trial and doubt about her vocation, but she stayed true to it. And as she stayed true to it, she was going with all this inner turmoil. And then, as a result of it, she came out with a new joy in the vocation that God had given her. We have to have perseverance, endurance, and stability. So much so that when we finally get monasticism developing in a more urban context, or at least a less desert-like context, we find St. Benedict. I don't know how many of you have ever read the rule of St. Benedict, but one of the vows that he made his monks take was a vow of stability. Because what would happen was you'd have these spiritually minded men who wanted to be monks, but they wanted to find the perfect monastery. So they would go from monastery to monastery looking for the perfect monastery. And of course, did they find it? Absolutely not. Because there's no such thing as a perfect monastery. There's no such thing as a perfect family. There's no such thing as a perfect religious order. So what he said was, stay in this place and be faithful to the rule that you have taken upon yourself as the yoke of Christ. So perseverance, endurance, and stability are crucial for the spiritual life. Now, I ask for a show of hands how many are married. How many of you are? Hold up the number of fingers of the children that you have. How many children do you have? Two, three, three, uh, five? <laughs> okay, good. Oh, by the way, uh, he did. Oh, you have six, Father. God bless you. My daughter and her son and son in law, they're expecting their sixth now. Okay. So very thing, and my other, and my son and his wife are expecting their third. So they keep multiplying, uh, but they're both they're faithful Catholics, and so they're being faithful to the church's uh, church's desires in that regard. The reason I say that is this: um, now some of you may not be old enough. Have you raised teenagers? Then you know that one of the most important things for as teenagers begin to begin begin to be more independent like driving on their own and doing things on their own and going places where you might not always know exactly where they are and so forth, you know that you always have to be in the background, right? You have to be the stable force in their lives. While they're out there exploring things in the world, they always need to know, I can always go back to mom and to dad, or in some cases to grandma and grandpa. Because 
These are the people that are the stable force in their lives. That is one very practical reason why it's important for us to be stable in our spiritual disciplines of our life. Very quickly, finally then, the third thing, what promise do the Desert Fathers hold for us today? Well, this is like they had in the Renaissance. The Renaissance, they had this saying that they used to go around saying, ad fontes, ad fontes, back to the sources. I'm so thankful that Father and Andy and others had this vision to, to do a course like this because the church fathers represent the sources of our faith. With scripture and the church fathers together, we have the foundation to rebuild a Christian culture. So the things that are listed here, you can read them on your own. I don't have to read all of them. But I do want to mention just one that I mentioned. Remember I, I talked about the Paphnutius and the history of the monks of Egypt? Under that theme that's number two there under Roman numeral three, where I say reclaiming our baptism, in the Western rite anyway, when a person is baptized, do you remember what the question that's asked them? Do you renounce Satan and all of his empty promises? We as baptized Christians have to ask ourselves that almost every day. Am I renouncing Satan? Am I renouncing his empty promises? Do I have the spiritual wherewithal to see that those, though, though those things are extremely attractive to me, and they, different things may be attractive to different people, nevertheless, they're empty promises. We need to have the pearl of great price. In every state of life, you can find holiness. And that's what we find in that story of Paphnutius. Let me quote. At the end of the story that I told you about where he went to the different people and he found that they were holy, he said, in every condition of human life, there are souls that please God and have their hidden deeds in which God takes delight. From this, it is plain that it is not so much profession or habit, and he means, I think, religious habit. It is not so much profession or habit that is pleasing to God as much as the sincerity and affection of the soul and honesty of deed. In the old Latin mass, the ends, and by the way, I was obviously, I wasn't a Catholic way back when the Latin mass was, but at the end of the mass, some of you may even remember, they used to say in Latin, ite misa est, go, the church is sent. Every one of us is called to be missionaries, but especially those of us who are lay people, because our mission field is out in the world. The divine liturgy is designed to feed our souls so that we can have the strength to go out. So add to the divine liturgy a life of asceticism, a life of prayer, a life of silence, and what we're going to find is that we may have more saints than we realize. God, I think, is asking us as Christians today not to fall into the trap that there could be secular solutions to our problems. That is not to say that we're not supposed to use our minds. It is not to say that we shouldn't be you know, involved in the legislatures and all of that. But the deepest problems of our society are the problems in the human heart. And, though, and if we do battle with the devil in the interior life, we will become instruments of God in dealing with the battle of the devil in our society around us. Here's what I'd like to close with, and this is on your sheet. It's the conclusion. It doesn't come from a desert monk, but it's from a, a bishop in ancient France, Gaul, who learned from the desert monks. And it was this, if we lead a careless life involving ourselves in too many occupations, refusing to observe chastity, not applying ourselves to fasting and vigils and prayers, neither reading sacred scripture ourselves nor willingly listening to others read it, the very remedies, that is the sacraments and the spiritual disciplines, the very remedies that God gives us are changed into wounds for us.
So may I suggest that as we take our Lenten journey together for the next three weeks, that we pray for one another and we make a commitment to, to living a more rigorous um, interior life. It doesn't mean necessarily that we live in the what well, people would today would consider the extreme forms of the Desert Fathers, but it means that we're willing to do battle with the devil. And that the way that we do that is by, li by the silence, by listening, by praying, by seeking to be God's instruments, by being changed from the inside out. Go ahead, Tom. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, Father. So, Dr. Howe, you alluded uh, to Paul and a, and, and a couple of other monks, um, I'll using your terms, making trips to town for Mass. Mm -hmm. how, how often did we see the fathers, you know, did they spend their time in the desert exclusively or did they make these, these trips to town, as you said, you know, for mass and, you know, to go for other errands and things like that? Well, I think it was very individual. No, there was nothing, as far as I can tell, there was nothing regulated or structured about this at all. These men like Anthony, he was, he was, had inherited a considerable amount of wealth for his day. Uh, Paul did as well. They just gave it away and they went out and lived in the desert. So um, the, the key was not so much how much did they come into the village or the town, but was what was their purpose for being there? So the rebuke that sometimes the monks give to one another is that they're in town for no good reason, right? It's not necessarily that they're up to evil, but it's just that they're, they shouldn't be just, you know, walking around the town or something doing nothing. They should go there for a specific purpose, whether it was go to mass or whatever it was. We don't actually know, at least I don't know, um, how many of these men were actual priests. I don't think many of them were. Um, in fact, in the Benedictine monasteries, we know later that in the Middle Ages, they usually would only have one priest. You know, they might have 70 monks there, and they were all uh, lame and lay monks kind of thing. They were, they were consecrated, but they weren't, they weren't priests. So I don't think most of these men were priests, so they couldn't celebrate the Eucharist on their own. Um, <clears throat> we know that by the fourth century, there was daily mass. Uh, letter 93, I think it is, of St. Basil. He talks about communion on certain days of the week. And we know from other writers the same way. Now, in the third century, in the late third and maybe early fourth, we don't know exactly you know, how often different parts of the church were. We're celebrating Mass every day, whether they were doing it every day or whether they were doing it uh, every week. Well, obviously, they were doing it every week. Uh, but we just, I guess, basically, the answer is no, we don't know. Uh, and it's because these are stories told to us without any kind of a systematic uh, introduction, the way you would, a modern person would write a book. They're just, they're just stories told to us about, Roger, about these monks. Can I jump in for a second just to clarify one point? You had mentioned about Mary the harlot, uh, who is a different Mary than Mary of Egypt. And uh, oh, somebody, am I right, doctor? I, you might be. Yes, yeah, I think it's a different, a different person. So Pat Smith made that post. But I do get into this question, Tom, uh, in my talk on Mary of Egypt, which is under our Apostolic Fathers series. I know Dr. Ken... She wasn't an apostolic father, but I was playing a little loose with my series. So uh, anyways, but we do have a talk on Mary of Egypt who goes out of the desert for 40 uh, years. And, um, and uh, so we talk, we get into that subject a little bit there, Tom, if you wanted to look that up further. Um, also, Thanks. there's a good question coming in from Daniel. Um, sorry, Andy, I know you're supposed to be asking these questions, but I saw this one and it looked good. But uh, I think it's a, it's a helpful question. He says, I understand that prayer is necessary to prepare for working with God, but to spend a lifetime in the desert, isn't that simply running from responsibility? Hmm. Yeah, it, it, it seems that way to, to us as modern people. And you know, I confess that I've done the same thing. Um, but people would say the same thing about religious life. You know, it's it's running away from the responsibilities of marriage and raising kids and all of that. I think it has to do with um, the individual uh, choice uh, that an individual makes to, to live a certain kind of life. Now, even within lay people, 
Um, there's some people in my in my parish here in, in Illinois uh, that are retired, and they're basically living like the desert monks live. I mean, they live a life of prayer, you know, ad infinitum. And, you know, you go in there in the, in the Eucharistic chapel, and they're always in there. Uh, and they they spend their whole life devoted to prayer, which, to be honest with you, is when I retire, retire, whatever that means exactly. <laughs> I'm retired already twice, and I'm going to go on another time. But then after my third or fourth time of retiring, <laughs> that's what I want to do, is is just spend my life spend my life praying. Is everybody called to that? No, obviously. And we'll talk about that in the third session. How do we find these wonderful practices within the context of the family, the context of our vocation uh, within the world? Um, is there have been times in the history of the church when, um, when it sure looked like people were getting... Like, for example, people would would uh, leave their families and go into a monastery in the Middle Ages. And that was in the West that they did that. Were they running away from their responsibilities? Well, I guess we'll have to leave that judgment to God. Um, I think part of the reason that we have the Desert Fathers is two beliefs that they had, which we don't have commonly anymore. One is that... Um, they had a little bit more, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> I was going to use a, a rather uh, earthy term, but let me use a little more delicate term. Uh, they weren't, as they used to say in the 1980s, wusses, right? They weren't spiritual. They weren't spiritually delicate people. They were willing to do the battle that was necessary, right? And probably within every man, there's a little bit of, you know, desire to do that as well. There's a second thing. They saw the desert as the place where they would, where the devil really dwelt. And this was commonly believed in the ancient world. And so they, that's why they went out into the desert, because they were going to do battle with them. Could it be in some cases an attempt to shirk one's responsibilities? I suppose it could be, yes. But not necessarily. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, we've got a question from Taylor. She asks, do you have any advice of, or reading recommendations for growing in self-knowledge and identifying our weaknesses? And just real quick, before you answer that, I just want to mention, Taylor, we're going to include these in the, in the email tomorrow. But three talks, there's Made for Excellence, Rediscovering Our True Identity, Walking with Faith, A Study of the Rule of St. Benedict, and then also Why Did I Do That, Forming Vice, or virtue in the human heart. All the links for those will be included in the email tomorrow. But Dr. Hal, are there any particular books that you would recommend on that subject of self-knowledge? Well, those things that you just showed on the screen, I think will probably be as good as anything. I have read some of John Cuddleback's stuff and, and he, he certainly does that well. But in terms of the, um, boy, oh, I think in this, this, the answer to this has to be very personal in the sense of what have I done? You know, you, Father, others might answer the question differently. Um, some of the modern spiritual writers that have helped me greatly, one of them is Michael Casey. Michael Casey is a Cistercian in Tarawan, I think it's called, in uh, Australia. Uh, and he is, I think, probably one of the great spiritual writers for, uh, for this generation. He's, he's quite old now. But as was uh, Thomas Merton for his generation. Um, when I've read Michael Casey, I've repeatedly come away with a sense of, boy, now I understand the struggle. Because what a spiritual writer does is he talks about a common human struggle, and then we use that as a mirror to see our situation in that. So, it really depends upon the individual, but it sounds like, especially that third one, about overcoming vice. Here's the, the only thing that I can really say about that. I wish I had greater wisdom, but here it is. That's all I've got. Um, I think it depends. You have to pay attention to what you're repeatedly drawn to. In other words, let's take an obvious example. 
suppose you have an overwhelming desire to abuse alcohol. And this is an obvious example. Well, if you, if you have this pull to do this over and over and over again, then clearly that's an issue that you're going to have to struggle with, right? But let's take something maybe not quite so um, obvious. Uh, that is the sycophant. A sycophant is a person who constantly desires, I mean, longs for other people's approval, right? They always want people to affirm them. Well, we all need some affirmation. But a person who makes that their highest goal in life is to always get affirmation and approval from other people is a person that can't learn to be content and happy within himself or herself. So that's not as obvious as say something like, you know, alcohol problem. But if we're constantly looking for other people's approval, that's not going to make us bold or what's the word courageous enough sometimes to do what is unpopular and still needs to be done. It's probably more of a comment, but I'm wondering if as the desert fathers, they go into the desert, they're carry on, carrying on Christ's battle against evil, but for us too, and at the same time, drawing down graces for others, for themselves, but for others. Right. Oh, yes, absolutely. Now, that the understanding of the mystical body I don't see that very much in their writings. Right. But that's where the father's comment at the beginning was important. In other words, um, we need to see what we read in them. We need to put it in the context of scripture yeah. and other, like Paul's doctrine of the mystical body, especially in the letter to the Ephesians and in other places. And you'll find this is true about theology and spirituality in general. One of the ways in which heresy arises is by taking some truth and pushing it out, taking it out of the context of the whole of the faith. And by the way, that's why the liturgy is so important. The liturgy of the church helps us to keep things in balance. I was reminded of this again when I was in McLean uh, a few weeks ago, had the privilege of speaking there. Um, and in the morning, before I spoke in the evening, I had the opportunity to go to uh, the Divine Liturgy at the Melkite Greek Catholic Church there. I think it's Holy Transfiguration. That's okay? right. And it's, it was wonderful. It was beautiful. Because I don't get to go to an Eastern liturgy very much. And, but what it reminded me was this holistic understanding of the church and of heaven and so forth. And I think it really comes out in the Eastern liturgy quite well. So my point, I guess, to, to, to summarize it is this, that... Yes, whatever we do for ourselves, in the end, we're also doing it for others because we're part of that mystical body. And that was certainly true of the, both by way of example and by way of mystical communion. Thank you. Thank you, Doctor. Uh, just two things in conclusion. Um, one is regarding that question of, of, of the uh, people that are seeking affirmation constantly, constantly. It's a growing problem that we face in our society. Uh, and there's been some studies done uh, by Catholic psychologists, very good studies regarding um, uh, the children of, uh, the adult children of alcoholics um, and drug users and things like that, which is a major growing problem in our society. And more and more, you know, our, our parents were living this particular lifestyle and we've inherited that. Dr. Cutterback's insights into human nature get into this. But there's a particular book called Healing the Unaffirmed um, that was very helpful in my own study, in my own life, actually. Um, and we'll put a link to that book. And I know it sounds like a little bit of a strange title, Healing the Unaffirmed, but there's a real uh, issue uh, that's de that develops in, in, in people that, um, that may go back to their early childhood. And, and when we're ministering to others, we need to be aware of this to see the person, the whole person. That, that, is, that is standing before us. And that whole person includes their, their own raising, where there, there may be real problems that have taken place. And if we can get into that and know where they've come from, we'll have a better chance of, of helping them.